And I'll remind you, please don't talk while these things are for us. Or usually in my class, you used to be chiming in whenever you want to. As soon as I turn the recording off, anything goes. Okay, ready? Okay, so we have this graph, okay? You've got values of A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Uh, you don't, a couple of you don't have D, E, and F. And make sure I explain that to you before you leave, okay? Easy. Okay, but we got G, we got C, you got your ABC numbers. In my case, uh, no, on my numbers are nice and evenly spaced. And that's what I just drew out of the hat. I didn't choose it that way. But I got really easy numbers. I hate to show off like that, but I did. Okay. Most of you got numbers that aren't quite that symmetric, but it's not going to matter. Whatever the numbers are. Okay. In my case, hang on a minute. History class. To me, history is just current events, stuff that happened. 60 years ago, still seems current. <laughs> uh, uh, so, my case, G and C and B, <coughs> 21, 9. Okay. That means this vertical line is x equals 21. And among other things, that means a coordinate of this on the x-axis is 21. Okay. Y equals nine. That means you got a profit of nine billion dollars. Okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna try to bezel so long, but no good me. I'm too easy to catch. Okay, uh, plus, I think I need a pretty good salary. For this. Okay, but I need an extra $12 million, right? Okay, uh, well, for power, darn it. Okay, uh, you read all kinds of things in the graph, be careful. Now, you got the point 21.9. Now we want to scale the X and the Y axis. And we're 21 here. And if this is 21, I like to use 16 or multiples of powers of 2, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 20, and so forth. Okay. So if 21's here, where do you think 16 would be? Well, I think it might be, oh, maybe not. Might not be a great estimate. I'm sure it is a great estimate. Might be halfway. Through. Okay. Well, here's 16. So here's eight. Here's four. Here's two. So I know that this is going to be 20. And I can subdivide each of these little intervals into half and then take half of each of those. And there I have a scale from zero to 16. Now, five would be about this. Uh, so, you know, 16 should have been a little further over. Right, right, right. These marks are a little further apart than these, right? That's why I did a real good job of estimating where 16 ought to be. Now, if I'd have had more room, I'd have estimated 32 and subdivided that, and I'd have probably got a pretty good graph to make estimates from. Okay. But this is just kind of a back of the envelope calculation that I want to do to kind of start thinking about my strategy for next year to maximize profits. Okay. Okay, so question is right, let's let's label the y axis to if this is nine, then I'm going to say eight is about here. So four would be halfway between eight and zero. Two would be down here, and there's one, three, five, and seven, and here's nine. And that looks pretty good, okay? 
that was a little easier to try to figure out where 16 goes compared to 21. But ballpark labeling. And then I can go up a little bit. Okay. Uh, four more. We're putting up about here. Divide that interval in half, divide that in half, divide that in half. And now I've got, well, right here. Actually, yeah, okay. That works. Okay, so now I've got my graph scale. And it's important to be able to scale your graph reasonably well because a lot of times I'll give you graphs, even on tests, or I'll use your A, B, C, D, E, F, and G number. Okay. So not everybody's doing the same thing. All right. Now, estimate the maximum profit. Okay, tell me when to stop. I'm going to run my finger along the graph and tell me where we reach the maximum profit. Ready? No, you can't say anything. You want to, okay, clap your hands when I reach the maximum profit. Okay? As I love applause. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Not where I figured about that, right? You're taking the bit. Okay. Now, according to my estimate, how am I going to get the maximum profit? Well, if you were there last time or saw a video and stuff, you know, whenever I have an important point on the graph, I'm going to project it to the left. All right. Now I'm going to draw the horizontal line. Okay. And then I'm going to draw the vertical line. And from here to here is what I call the projection line. Now I'm going to extend it down here so I can label it. It's between 15 and 16. So I'm going to say that's about 15.6. Debate between 0.6 and 0.7, but I really shouldn't debate too much about that because this is a hand drawn graph. Okay. And my scale is great. So even estimating temps is a little bit inappropriate, but I'll do it anyway. Okay. But you have a more accurate graph you want to estimate the test. Up here, it looks like my profit is about 11.5. So I label this line Y is 11.5. And now I can say this point is fifteen point six, eleven point five. Now, what's 15.6? Is that the profit? Say yes or no. No, no. Okay. That's X. And I didn't say what X is. X is the widget constant. Okay. And of course, for this point, X is 15.6. So you're selling your widgets for $15.6 or $15.6 thousand dollars, whatever your widgets happen to be. Okay. Widgets just kind of catch all term, used a lot in economics. Okay. So that is the price of something you're selling. Or it, it is something you're selling. This would be the price of that thing. Y equals 11.5. Okay, what's that 11.5? Well, that's your profit, isn't it? So this maximum profit
<clears throat> and the widget price is 1560. Okay. That means if my model is right and if I'm the guy that's making the models or a bit of the head of the team making the models, okay. I better know what I'm talking about. So, you know, this, this curve is predicted from all kinds of factors, market factors and so forth, but it comes down to the more the price of the widget, the fewer people are going to buy it. Okay, so if I raise the price of the widget, in a sense, that's tending to decrease my profits, okay? On the other hand, the more I charge for the widget, the more I make for everyone, and that tends to increase my profits. And this graph shows how all that combines, okay? And in a way that's really kind of easy to understand. We'll be able to understand that uh, in a little while, but probably not today. Okay, so that's what I was hoping to see on your work, okay? Looks like this. Now, you don't know at this point how to make an accurate toolkit squaring function. Okay. Like you might make your tool squid pairing function. You have your toolkit squaring function. You might make it too flat at the bottom. Or you might make it too sharp at the bottom, okay? So try not to do that, but it's no big deal because you're gonna learn how to draw a really nice one, I think today, okay? And Daniel already knows, he did it for homework, okay? Reading ahead on, I don't know what you do. It looked really good, really good glass. Okay, so anyhow, there's your tool, it's far in place. Now, all I want you to do is take that graph, take sketch one yourself, and then show me a bunch of points on the x axis that correspond to points in this graph. Okay. So just and like, okay, there's a point on the graph. Come down here. There's a point on the x axis. Put a little x in there. Okay. Get another point on the graph. Now draw me a bunch of points on the x axis that correspond to points on the curve. Okay, I'm going to start at the left. I got a point, then I'll draw some more points. I'll draw one here, I'll draw one here, I'll draw one here. There's a point right here, one here, one here, oh, one here, and a point all the way to the right here. Okay, make sense? Okay, those points are in the domains. All the x values that correspond to points on the graph are in the domain of the graph function. Okay. Now, there are points that you didn't indicate, right? 
Can you somehow indicate all possible points? You don't have time to do projection lines for all of them because they're infinitely many points and you don't have infinitely many times, infinitely much time. Okay. So how would you indicate all the points that correspond to the points on the graph? All the X values that correspond to points on the graph. I think you maybe know it. Do it. And if not, where all the X values correspond to points on the graph. <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm going to show you. Gave you a chance to show off, but it's okay. Here, I'll show you. Just take your yellow chalk and you say an interval, and you put a big dot here. And a big dot here. Now, if you don't have yellow chalk, then maybe you draw something that looks like this. I don't want to do that here because I want to write something there, but I'll just kind of. And here's all I mean. I'm slot the graph down. Yeah, that's a little too pointy, but it's still reasonably representative. Okay, so put all the points from here. Here and then I just make a heavier line on that part of the x axis. Okay. And that's an interval, and we can have interval notation and stuff. You learn that easily. That's easy to understand. Okay. But this is what it means. Okay. Uh, Well, there's a more formal definition of domain that you'll see. Okay. That's it. That's what the domain is. That's what it means. Okay. Oops. Okay. No recording. Okay. Now do the same thing for a reciprocal function. And most of you know what graph looks like. But there's a reasonable facsimile if you don't. Okay, let's first look at the Squaring function. Okay, you have a point here that goes to here, and of course, so does this point, right? Actually, this point's a little higher. This point goes over to here, this point goes to here. Then you have points here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and, here, and so forth. And they go all the way down. To the origin. So that would be the set of points. And it goes all the way to the origin because zero, zero is on the graph. Now, if you didn't draw it that way, if the graph's a little above the x axis, well, I said do it as you graphed it, right? Okay. So maybe the domain wouldn't be. Okay. Um, after the reciprocal function, Got a point here. 
uh, point here. We don't have any point between the x axis and this because that's as low as they go. You can't draw the whole reciprocal function, okay? It goes forever. It goes forever. We just draw part of it, okay? And the toolkit function is only going to be a part of it. We worry later about what happens to the rest of it. Okay, so I put a dot here and a dot here. And that's all my set of water values. Okay, over here, that's in the way I drew it. I didn't draw it particularly accurately because if it's drawn accurately, this point's as far above the axis as this one is below. I didn't say draw it accurately, I said just slop one down, right? Take what you get. You'll learn quickly how to draw these. If you're moving along with this real well, I think we're going to actually get to that. So we've got points here. Okay. So here's the range. All the range. And I used yellow before. So I'm going to find my piece of yellow chalk. You kind of shade the. There's your domain. Here, here's your domain. And here's your range. Now, quickly, we don't waste class time being meticulous. Slop down a graph representing. It's actually you've already got one. Okay. Shade the domain and the range of the graph that you drew. Okay. Uh, so ask me to do the graph we started with. I've been using yellow chalk and purple chalk. No, blue chalk. Okay. Okay. Well, the domain, the graph as I drew it, and the graph as you drew it probably it starts here and ends here. So it appears that we have X values all the way over to here and all the way over to like here. So the domain would be this. Now, some of you chose to restrict the domain only to positive values of the profit. That's not really appropriate because you can lose money. Okay. Set the price too high, you start losing money. Okay. Now, another way that people might have restricted the domain is they just started the domain here. Now, that's reasonable. Okay. Start the domain here because. What does it mean for next value to be over here? It means you're charging negative money for your widgets. It means you're paying people to take them. I don't know about your business, but I'm not doing that in mine. Okay. So be very reasonable to restrict the domain from here to here. Okay. That's not reasonable, though, if you if your curve went down below the x-axis here, that's entirely possible. You can charge enough that you lose money. Okay. So you can have negative watts. Okay. Now, the maximum Y value you would have would be here. And the minimum Y value, the way I've done it, is all the way down here. Okay, that makes sense. And that's the domain, this range. Okay, the range as this thing is drawn here goes all the way from here to here. 
but we could make a reasonable restriction on the domain that would change the range. So I can do a restricted domain. Well, that doesn't compress at all. I think it's a different color. So I'm going to say, actually, green doesn't contrast that well with yellow either. What contrasts with yellow? Blue, but I'm already using it. Okay. Oh, I can use red except what I really need. Okay, so I have the domain is drawn. In yellow. That I have more appropriate. Domain in here. And this kind of shows you why you want to think about domain and range. Okay. If you have an applied problem, a lot of times you have a function that could be defined for all kinds of values that aren't appropriate to what you're looking at. This is a parabola. There's a simple, relatively simple formula for this thing. That formula applies all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. But there's a certain maximum you're going to charge for your widgets. Okay, like it wouldn't make any sense to set the price of a widget greater than the gross national product of the world. <laughs> okay, all the money that's generated in the world. It's so never nobody's ever going to buy it, right? And you might say, okay, my widgets go up to fifteen dollars on this model, but we're going to you know just extend the model. But, at thirty dollars, I know at thirty dollars nobody's going to buy it. Okay, but very few people are going to buy it, uh, and I know that that's going to destroy my business. So I'm not. I'm going to restrict the domain from zero to thirty. Well, that's about what this looks like. We might want to extend it a little further than thirty if this is the curve, uh, because we want to see how much money we lose if we go up to forty or fifty dollars. Probably not a relevant strategy. We make a decision based on everything we know. Okay. And we usually extend the domain a little further than we think we are. Okay. Doesn't hurt. But we certainly don't extend the domain to the negative numbers because that would be paying people to take our widgets. We're not going to do that. So we, we have a hard and fast limit here there's some limit out here uh okay and then if we restrict the domain go from here to here then our restricted range would go from here to here Because we don't even want to think about what happens if we pay people to take these things. Okay. And there might be other times when you would restrict the domain just to positive values of why. Because there's no reason to think about what happens if you lose money. We're not going to, we're not going to set the price that high. Okay. But maybe we want to think about what happens if we accidentally do this. So it's a decision. It's a decision. There's flexibility in how we set a domain and a range. Now, the main reason I'm discussing this is because you have to understand that domain and range are kind of important concepts in applications. So we want to talk about the domain and range of different functions. 
Okay, so that's all I want to tell you about domain and range. Comes into that first problem. And then I ask you to do the same thing in the second problem. First problem, I ask you to do it. You've already done it, except you haven't done it for the exponential. Okay. First problem, I ask you to do it for the squared function, quadratic function. Okay. Second problem, I ask you to do it for the reciprocal function. Third problem, I ask you to do it for the exponential function. So do that. I'm going to take two minutes. Okay. Okay, so I've got a graph, got the coordinates of the point on the graph. And from that, I can get a scale and I can estimate the coordinates of these two points. Well, here's seven. Here's 14. If I want the coordinates of this first point, I can do a projection. Horizontal line through that points at y equals, well, if this is 14, what's this? I'm going to say that looks like 18 to me. Is that a reasonable estimate? If this is 14, then from here to here would be 18. I think that's reasonable. If you don't, you can make your own estimate. You don't have a problem where I ask you to estimate. Okay. And down here is x equals, you know, there's seven. There would be 14. I'd say x is 15. Yeah. So this point is 15, 18. Then I could estimate. The coordinates of the second point. Oh, it looks like I drew that one pretty close to 14. So I'm going to say y is 14. And x is, let's see, if that's 15, and I'm going to say that's about 19. So this is a point 19, 14. Make sense? And what's the change? In X, and what's the change in Y? For it now, change in X equals change in Y. You don't even have to copy the graph. You can do it visually from the graph that you can see. How much does X change? How much does Y change? Some people got it, some people didn't. Whether they got it or not, it's fine. Let's look at what this means. What's the change in X? We've got a point here and a point here, right? X goes from 15 to 19, right? So the change in X is well, the calculation is pretty easy. 19 minus 15, that's 4. Okay. What's the change in Y? Well, now that's a little tricky because if we go from this point to this point, the change in X is 4, right? Now, if we were to go from this point to this point, the change in X would be negative 4, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, generally, we'll think of going from the left to the right. So as we go from left to right, what happens to y? It changes from 18 to negative 14, right? So the change in y is the value you end up with minus the value you start with. And that's going to be 14 minus 18. That's negative 4. Okay. So up here, I'm going to draw a triangle that represents this. It's called what I call a fundamental triangle. You're not going to see that language anywhere else. But I think this is really fundamental to both pre-calculus and calculus. Okay, so here's the triangle.
I'm going to draw arrows from this point to this point. If I go from here to here, I've got an arrow like this. If I go from here to here, my arrow is this. So I have a path from the first point to the second point. Okay. So I've got a path the first point to the second point. And along that path, y changes by negative four, and x changes by plus four. So this should be familiar to you now. Negative four has a name called the rise. And what do you think the name of this is? Well, I don't, don't want to take the time to stop the video. This is called the run. Now, what do you think the slope is? What's slope? Slope is defined as rise divided by run. It can be defined by a formula that has no meaning y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, but it's defined, in my opinion, as rise over run, and the formula then follows from the definition in a way we'll see later. Right now, you just estimate the coordinates of two points, find the rise, find the run. The slope is rise divided by run in this case that's just negative one so we put the slope here and we put a box around it to indicate that it's a slope instead of a displacement or a distance okay and that tells us what the slope is. The average rate is the change in y divided by the change in x. Okay, y is going to be the amount of money. T is going to be time in hours. This is in dollars. Order to this point, let's say, are five and eighty. The coordinates to this point would then be like nine and 150. What's the story? Well, the story here might be after five hours, we got $80. After nine hours, we got $150. At what rate are we gaining money? Well, we draw our fundamental triangle. Go from left to right, and we have plus four here and plus 70 
Here, those numbers should be pretty obvious. We'll go from 80 to 150, that's plus seven. The run is four, the rise is seven. Okay. The slope. It's seventy dollars divided by four hours. This means you make seventy dollars in four hours. Now, if you make seventy dollars in four hours, everybody can figure out how many dollars per hour. That's natural. You can think in terms of dollars per hour. So I use this as an example. How many dollars per hour is that? Well, you divide four into seventy. Unfortunately, it doesn't. It gives you seven point seventeen point five dollars per hour. So your slope is seventeen point five, meaning you're making seventeen and a half dollars an hour. Okay, that's somewhat above minimum wage. It's not too bad. You know, you can kind of live on that. You might not live high on it, but you live. Okay. Better than minimum wage is less than half that in this state. In this okay. Uh, okay, the point is that's a rate of change. That's an average rate of change. When they average, you're making seventeen and a half dollars per hour. I say average because the first two hours you might have been working at one job, we made thirty dollars an hour. Okay. And well, that last two hours, you only made five dollars an hour because you switched jobs. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Doesn't make sense to you know go from seven thirty dollars to five dollars. You hope that doesn't happen, but if that happened, so it's an average rate of change. An instantaneous rate of change. For the first two hours would be thirty dollars an hour. For the last two would be five dollars an hour. Right? Okay. There's your average. Okay. So this is something I want you to work on. I want you to do the best you can. Follow the instructions and we'll the email if you want clarification. Follow the instructions. But the problems up to not including one H A one. When you get to the one page, basically that's where you stop. Okay. Now you finish off that one on the exponential function, draw that domain of range, take two minutes. But draw it on the paper, bring the paper inside and see how you do it. Okay. Everybody did real well today, see? I think you think you're well on track. Uh, not sure everybody got the thing on exponential function. So that was an assignment in the old math. Uh, so I'm going to extend that for a couple of days, but it's not exponential function, it's just exponents. Okay. Um, get that done. Uh, you don't want that. That's just algebra one review, but you don't want that getting in your way uh, as you move through the course. Okay. So you want to get that done.